So what I thought I'll do today is to introduce analog design. Okay. So if you look at any signal processing system today, this is the picture that you'll see. So this is what I call the real world, where you have analog signals. It could be audio or it could be video. So analog signal refers to some signal that has continuous values of amplitude and is defined for all values of time. Okay. Now today also all of the systems have some digital signal processing and digital storage. The digital format is very convenient for uh, storage because you have to store, if you have to store a finite length of audio, let's say my lecture for 45 minutes, if you, the analog format still has infinite number of values whereas the digital format has finite number of values. And there are some uh, conditions under which you can go between analog to digital without losing any information, although you go from a, an infinite number of points to a finite number of points, okay. So a typical system today looks like this, you have uh, continuous time and continuous amplitude and that gets converted to digital using some interface electronics. It could be, you will have amplifiers here, you will have analog signal processing in this blue box. You will also have analog to digital conversion, okay. And inside you have uh, digital signal processing and storage and sometimes the DSP generates signals, okay, just like your MP3 player or any players that output signals, it is stored in a digital form and there is some signal processing that goes on in the digital format, but finally it comes out in an analog format, okay. So there again you have digital to analog conversion and some amplification and other analog signal processing. So a typical signal processing chain consists of uh, signal processing in both analog and digital domains and also conversion between analog and digital formats of data, okay. Now, Analog electronics, analog ICs, where are they used? They are used in these blocks where you have analog signal processing as well as analog to digital conversion, also digital to analog conversion. The conversion between analog and digital formats is done by analog ICs, okay. And we will be studying a subset of this type of ICs. Now today's chips, like almost all of them will have some analog content. Uh, depending on the functionality, the analog content may be more or less, okay. Now, this is where like on VLSA chips, these are the analog functions that you see. You have analog to digital conversion, digital to analog and of course amplification. And you also do signal processing at high frequencies in the analog domain, mainly because it becomes too expensive in terms of power to do it in the digital format. If you already have a signal at a very high frequency, you can't oversample it and store it in a digital format. Even if you can do it, it may be too power hungry. So you do it in analog domain. And finally, you have some other things that you take for granted. I mean, when we draw circuits, we write VCC and bias voltages all over the place without defining how we get them. So you do have to have these voltage references, voltage regulators, current sources and so on. All of the biasing circuits. That again, you can call them uh, analog circuits. So they will have some specifications like uh, accuracy and uh, area and so on, okay. So that's where they are used and then you also have oscillators. So even digital circuits need oscillators to provide a reference clock and you also have phase lock loops which are basically oscillators enclosed in a feedback loop to get you accurate uh, frequencies, okay. In fact, the last two, this power management and oscillators and PLLs, they are found even in purely digital ICs, okay. If you take a microprocessor, it will have a PLL because if you have a 3 gigahertz microprocessor, you do not feed in a 3 gigahertz clock, that will again consume too much power. So what you send in may be a 150 megahertz clock, you multiply it by a factor of 20 inside the chip and also when you say a 3 gig microprocessor, it is not like every part of the circuit is working at 3 gigahertz, there will be something working at 3, something working at 1.5 maybe some, some other frequencies, okay. So you will need to generate a number of different frequencies, so you will need uh, perhaps different oscillators and some analog circuits to do that, okay. So there is a lot of role for uh, analog ICs in the modern VLSI world. Just to take some examples. So this is, this is an image sensor. I took all these papers from a particular conference, the International Solid State Circuits Conference. This is from 2004. 
Now, this is an image sensor, so the middle square area that you see, image area, that has these image sensors, basically some photosensitive circuits, okay. And in each pixel, there will be some small electronics. It can be an amplifier also, okay. And then on uh, the rows and columns, you will have decoders. Basically, if you know how a digital camera works, it will have a number of pixels arranged in a rectangular array, and each pixel will give out the intensity that it received, okay, intensity of light at the time of exposure. So, this is something like that. This is like a camera, okay, or uh, it could be a movie camera also, like a webcam. So, you are supposed, you should take information from all of these pixels and then process them in some way. So, mainly the idea here is not to describe how the chip works, but to just show what analog blocks are here. So, for instance, the intensity that you receive is some analog value and you need analog to digital converters to store it in a digital format, okay. So, at the bottom right you see a 10 bit pipeline ADC, okay. You do not have to know what pipeline is, but it is just an analog to digital converter, okay. And you have some noise cancellation circuit here that is also analog and then you have timing generator. Timing generator basically means something like an oscillator and a phase lock loop, okay. And you have a voltage regulator on top. So, all the blocks that I described in the previous slide are more or less found here. So, this is some, so basically some parts of the chip are analog, some other parts are digital, okay. In this case, there is a lot of analog circuitry. Another example is a wireless LAN transceiver. So, if you have a laptop or something with a wireless LAN card, this is the RF part of that wireless LAN card, okay. There will be a radio part and there will be a digital part. So, this is the radio part of it. So, again, because it is a radio, it is predominantly an analog type of chip and potentially you can put this chip together with the entire digital part to make a much larger chip, okay. So, you will have the, you have the receivers here and you have the transmitter, you have the power amplifier and bias and frequency synthesizer, which again is a phase lock loop that generates the carrier frequency. So, all of you are familiar with radios to some extent. So, it has some carrier frequency and some modulation frequency. The carrier frequencies are generated using the synthesizer. In fact, it has two synthesizers for some functions. Depending on the architecture, you may need different frequencies, okay. And you have some control. Typically, that tends to be digital, okay. And inside each of these blocks, there can be some part that is digital for control and some part that is analog, okay, for signal processing. Now, this is an example of a high frequency signal processing where predominantly the circuits are analog, okay. Now, this is the other way around. This is a DRAM. So, it is basically a digital chip. So, it has all these uh, data storage cells and lots of data lines and so on. But it does have some analog circuitry. It, uh, I mean, not everything is marked, but if you go in the middle, I think there will be voltage regulators and things like that. And also, there is a there is a bunch of sense amplifiers. Again, those of you who know the RAM architecture know that there are sense amplifiers. They are basically analog amplifiers that are supposed to amplify the small difference that is generated by the RAM cell into something that can be distinguished as digital logic, okay. And at the bottom you see some VPP pump. So, what this is, it is a block that generates a voltage that is more than the power supply. Okay, it is like a voltage doubler or something. For some functionality inside they need this and that also is a is an analog circuit. Okay. So, even in a predominantly digital circuit like DRAM you do have little bits of analog here and there. Okay. And you have uh, these input output buffers. Now, they are supposed to be transmitting digital data, but sometimes their design can involve analog design principles. Okay. So, that is just to give you a flavor of uh, where analog circuits are used today. Uh, what happened was analog circuits, analog circuits were the predominant way of uh, signal processing in the 60s and so on. Then with the advent of CMOS circuits, it became digital. So, it was assumed that everything would become digital. Then again, it was found that uh, it was not a good idea to make everything digital. So, some things are best done in analog, some things are best done in digital. So, today in fact, the fancy is to make analog circuits that are programmable digitally, okay. So, for instance, you have analog circuits with some imperfections that can be corrected digitally. So, that is the best way of doing circuits today. And of course, as technology evolves, the style will change, but I think some form of uh, design will remain, okay. 
So what can you do after learning this course? So there are lots of companies that are willing to give you jobs. And uh, every multinational is trying to start up here. The largest known is TI. They have been here for a long time. And others also. I think this is the placement season. So you would have at least heard of the company's names. And then there are also Indian startups like Cosmic, Karmic and so on which have uh, set up shop to do the same thing basically. So there is a high demand for skilled designers and that's true in any design, any area because uh, skilled designers are hard to find and it's particularly so in analog IC design in India today because people sense that it's a good business opportunity to get into this. Okay. And so the good thing is it's uh, design is always interesting because it can go on some creativity. Not all creative fields are profitable. Right. So, this is something that is interesting as well as profitable. So, it may be worthwhile pursuing. <coughs> so, what is the goal of the course? Again, uh, the analog IC design, if you would rip up an analog IC, uh, a whole bunch of circuits. Now, we obviously cannot go through all of it. And the emphasis in this course is on depth, not really on breadth. It is not a survey of uh, 100 different kinds of circuits. It is about how to design one particular thing in great detail. and uh, what we have found is that using that you can learn other things easily. But if you are given a survey of a lots of circuits, lot of circuits, you can't really go deep into it. Okay. So what uh, we try to do in this course is to learn how to design negative feedback amplifiers on CMOS ICs. Okay. We have to choose some technology, so we use choose CMOS, which is the dominant technology of the day. And the blocks that we'll try to design. The final theme is to get a negative feedback amplifier working. Now, this will involve, because it involves feedback, it will involve making it stable and so on, okay, and to get sufficient accuracy, etc., etc. So, the idea is to use negative feedback for controlling the output, and these are directly used in amplifiers. We know op amps. The whole idea of op amps is to use negative feedback to get accurate circuits. Similarly, with voltage references, that is how you make voltage regulators, okay, voltage references and voltage regulators, and also biasing circuits. Okay, so many of these examples we will see in particular, and those we don't see, I think you can still uh, extend the principles learned here to other circuits. Okay, you are required to know circuit analysis like nodal analysis, mesh analysis, all of this. Okay, if you have forgotten it, please go and refresh your uh, basics. Okay, now what I have found is generally people don't write the equation systematically or something and especially in exams there is some goof or the other. So it doesn't have to be. And the kind of circuits that we do hand analysis at most you will have to do two simultaneous equations right. So there is there should not be any difficulty with uh, this. But you should be perfect with uh, this thing so that you can do the design properly okay. Analysis is a prerequisite for design. And small and large signal analysis and Laplace transforms again you are not required to know all of the theoretical details like region of convergence and all those things, but you should know the Laplace transforms of familiar functions like uh, exponentials and damp sinusoids and so on. As well as you should have a feel for uh, what happens like what are poles and zeros and those type of things. And similarly frequency response and Bode plots. You should know some differential equations. Again this is not the, we are not required to solve the complicated differential equations okay, but you should be able to set up the differential equation for a given circuit and maybe solve a first or second order if necessary. Okay. And ideal op amp circuits again you are expected to know in this, uh, we will review some of these things but uh, you are expected to know these things and basic transistor models like MOSFET models and circuits. Again the, all of this will be revised, Okay, the last two parts. Has any of you, is any of you not familiar with one or more of these topics? Everyone is familiar with everything? Good. So, what I will go through is uh, first an introduction and review. It is not even a review, it is more of a reminder of uh, circuit analysis, Laplace transforms and then we will do a more extensive review of amplifiers using negative feedback and also negative feedback circuits using op amps in particular. Okay. This is the initial part of the course. Next, what we will try to do is to go through <coughs> amplifier circuits on ICs, that is CMOS ICs. So, now design of uh, integrated circuits is done slightly differently than design of discrete amplifiers, okay. Mainly because of different kinds of components available and different trade offs. So, for instance, like in an IC, it is perfectly okay to use 10 transistors in place of 1 if it makes your circuit better. 
But in discrete, you would not do that, right? If you if you can make a two transistor circuit and somebody else makes a ten transistor circuit, I would probably pick the two transistor circuit. But in ICs, that's definitely not the case. I could very well pick a hundred transistor circuit if it looks better and if it has smaller area. It's possible that uh, hundred transistor circuit has a smaller area than two two, uh, two transistor circuits. Okay. Then we'll go through the we'll go through all of the components that are available for us in a general CMOS IC process. We will go through the device models. So, these are familiar models like the DC small signal, large signal and the AC small signal. We will also go through some things that are probably unfamiliar to you like random mismatch and noise models. Okay. And we will uh, use these models to analyze single transistor amplifier stages and we will see how to bias the transistor and see some com uh, amplifier stages that have more than one transistor and we will go through differential amplifiers and fully differential circuits. Normally, even differential circuits that you have encountered so far like an op amp have differential input but single ended output. But on an IC it is beneficial to make something that has differential inputs and differential outputs. Okay. So, that we will see how to do. The last part of the course is to put these amplifiers together and to make op amps okay. for single ended op amp and uh, fully differential op amps. And there are different kinds of architectures of op amps. Again, they do not mean anything to you because you do not know what the architectures are, but there are some things known as folded and telescopic cascode op amps, and there is something known as a two stage op amp. They are suitable for different applications. We will see what they are when we come to them. Okay. And we will sort of see some applications. Uh, there is something known as a band gap reference, that is the universal standard for voltage reference. Okay. When you get a voltage regulator, let us say 7805 or something that gives you 5 volts, how does it give you 5 volts? It is based on some reference like this. Okay. And there are some other kinds of uh, bias generation. So, you may bias the transistor at a given current, at a given voltage or at a given transconductance, we will see some of those things as well. Okay. So, that is the, those are the, those are what we plan to cover in the course. But it is not some uh, fixed menu that we have to eat by the end of the course, right. So, if something is not easily understood, then we will go through that slowly and then if something is already done, we will go through that fast and so on. We'll, it will be adaptive also based on the class. So, one thing I would like to appreciate is the difference between design and analysis, especially design it seems it is kind of hard for students at IIT or maybe students everywhere. So, the main difference is in when you are doing design you are creating something that does not yet exist whereas, when you are analyzing you are given something and you are analyzing that. Okay. So, the process of design necessarily has some vagueness to it. Okay. It may not be very clearly defined or it may be defined, but not mathematically. So, you cannot get the answer by solving n equations containing n variables. Okay. That is the main difference. So, there is a bit of a starting trouble because you set up some equations and the information is incomplete. So, you necessarily have to start somewhere and go through trial and error. Okay. That is essential part of design. So, to be able to design you need to know analysis, but that is not sufficient. Okay. So, analysis knowing analysis very well is very good because once you do design it cannot be that you put something together haphazardly and expect it to work. You still have to analyze it, but just knowing analysis is not good enough. Okay. You have to be more familiar with circuits than just being able to analyze it. You should have multiple ways of looking at building blocks. Again, when we analyze circuits in this course, we will try to do that. Okay. And you should be comfortable with some trial and error approaches. Again, trial and error should be guided by your theoretical knowledge, but you need trial and error because not everything can be modeled mathematically, at least not very easily. Okay. And you should develop intuitive thinking and understanding. I will talk a little bit about this soon and of course, the last three are uh, something that I mean some people have more of and some people have less of, but you can try to deliberately develop that as well. Okay. If you do not have curiosity, I do not think you will be able to design very well, because many times I see students the theoretical answer is something x or 1 and you simulate it and you get 1000 and there is no attempt to figure out why it came out to be 1000 and this is 1 and so on. So, that is not a good attribute. If you see something that is odd, whatever it is, you should try to figure out what is going on. Okay, and that's where your analytical skills will help. And what I mean by open mind is, 
many times in courses because of time constraints and so on we have to say like normally you do things in certain way but you should not be bound to that way okay of course some things are physical laws like kirchhoff's current law you can't violate even if you wish to but uh, let's say i'll say somewhere that oh you use two stage op amps in this application but maybe somewhere down the line in a different technology two stage op amp is the right not the right solution it may be one stage op amp it may be three stage op amp okay so you should keep an open mind to other solutions also okay so just because something was not used for a particular application in a certain situation it doesn't mean it should not be used okay you should be able to you have a certain uh, uh, choice of solutions you should be able to evaluate them okay you shouldn't close your mind to certain solutions even before evaluating them and of course the last thing is extremely important thoroughness is the most important attribute you can have again this is something that can't be tested in an exam so you can go through a course without being thorough but if your design has to work it's not enough to fool me in the exam it's you can't fool the physical law right so what will end up happening is that the circuit won't work so if if the circuit has to work you have to be able to analyze it and simulate it thoroughly before you fabricate it okay <coughs> and the intuition is again something that is somewhat misunderstood it is true that some people have uh, more intuitive ways of thinking but it's not that uh, you can't learn intuition you can you can kind of practice it but one thing is intuitive thinking doesn't mean it's sloppy thinking okay intuitive thinking generally means that oh you don't actually go through the whole analysis and do it but that doesn't mean you blurt out the answer that comes to your mind the first time okay it's basically the way you solve things intuitively is you already have solved some similar problems and then you you are familiar enough with it that when you see a new problem you link it to that and observe that the solution must come out this way or that way okay and you would have done this kind of things in competitive exams and so on so sometimes you get an answer you're not sure right i mean you don't know that field very well so you're not sure of the answer so you do some dimensional analysis or something just to verify the sanity of the solution so it, this is similar to that but a little bit more than that okay so you related to other problems you use boundary conditions dimension checks all of those things and you can build your intuition and the way you to do that is you solve many problems and when you see a problem you first try to you spend some time thinking about how the solution is going to come out okay before actually putting pen to paper perhaps and even after that you don't launch into a full blown mathematical analysis maybe you do a little bit of uh, analysis to see what the answer is going to come out then you do the full analysis and see maybe the answer is the same in which case it's good your intuition was right maybe the answer is different in which case you see where the intuition went wrong and the intuition also can be sharpened by other mathematical uh, tricks that you can that you know right so clearly the, an exam is not the place to start this right so you do this during the assignments okay. and whenever you are practicing problems so clear i mean this is something like this is going to take more time i mean if you probably if i give you a network analysis problem and you set up the equations and solve it it will take you some time and if you do all of this it's obviously going to take you more time but it is definitely useful i think the difference is maybe the difference between being driven to some place and being given a map and asked to go to that place okay it's going to take you long lot more time to figure out your way using the map you walk around you do some trial and error and maybe you have to backtrack but you finally reach the destination but then the advantage of this is you will be able to go to other places that are nearby and you can do it on your own you don't have to be driven to every place okay it's roughly the analogy but so it is worthwhile doing that exploring things on your own before uh, <coughs> doing full blown analysis and the assignments are a good opportunity to do, to do this because you have lots of time to do them okay so that's about uh, the sort of motivation for the course and the contents any questions so far <coughs> so what i'm going to do in the rest of this class is to just very quickly review circuit analysis again i said that uh, it's a little bit of concern that uh, people don't set up the equations properly and then solve it every quiz this happens so hopefully it won't happen this time so this is what is circuit analysis you either write kcl or kirchhoff's voltage law now <coughs> you have n equations and n unknowns and you solve them okay in case of an n node circuit you have n node voltages and you solve for them and in case of m independent loops you solve for loop currents that's how you solve these uh, kirchhoff's current and voltage laws okay 
Now, typically we end up using Kirchhoff's current law, but of course you can use the other one also. So, nodal analysis simply consists of uh, writing equations where the sum of currents flowing out of a particular node equals the current source that is connected to that node. Okay. So, that is all that is there. I mean, this is again not meant to be a full uh, analysis course. I am just writing the equations here. So, for instance, I11 means the current that is going from the node 1 to ground. 1 2 is between node 1 and node 2 and so on. Sum of all of that should be equal to, if there is a current source connected to node 1, it should be equal to that. Okay. That is all that is there. So, this is, with this you should be able to solve any uh, circuit and it does not uh, have to be linear also. Okay. So far I have not said anything about the dependence of the currents on voltages. Okay. Even if you have a nonlinear circuit, this is how you solve it. Perhaps you can't solve it by hand, then you feed it to a calculator or a computer, but this is how you solve circuits. Okay. So, all of the notation is given here and this will be on the website also, but anyway, this is how you solve it and it can be a nonlinear function. If it happens to be a linear function, these things will be some linear combinations of voltages. Okay. The left hand side of will be a linear combination of voltages, something like this. Instead of I11, you have some conductance times V1 and so on. So, this is how you end up with, uh, this is the equation that you end up with if you have a linear circuit, okay. Where if you have G11 is the conductance between node 1 and ground and G21 and G12 are conductances between node 1 and node 2 and so on, okay. So, all this you should be familiar with. The only reason I am going through it is so to refresh you and if you feel that you are not very comfortable with it, go back and practice a few problems, okay. Now, you can't really write equations in this form if you have independent voltage sources, okay. If you have a voltage source at a particular node, you do not know the current through it. So, you can't really write Kirchhoff's current law. Then what you do? You strike off the equation for that particular node, but replace it with, you know what voltage it is, right. So, you just replace it with that equation. So, you have same, still the same number of equations and same number of unknowns. And it can be a voltage control voltage source, in which case Again, you strike off that and replace it with the equation governing the voltage control voltage source. So, similarly, you make some manipulations for uh, current control voltage source, okay. So, all you do is instead of uh, instead of this current, you draw the, you write the controlling current, okay. So, once you see these equations, it will become clear. And similarly, you can have a voltage controlled current source, in which case, instead of the independent source that is connected, you also have the control source on the right hand side and you can take it to the left hand side, ok. And in case of an ideal op amp, again you cannot write the Kirchhoff's current law at the output of an op amp, because you do not know what current is going into the op amp, ok. So, you strike off that equation and replace it with the equation at the input of the op amp which says that the two input terminal voltages are equal, ok. That is all. So, every circuit can be analyzed like this. All you have to do is to be a little bit systematic and you should get the right answer, ok. So, in all these cases you will end up with equations like this. Now, the equations may be modified in case of voltage sources or op amps or whatever, but you will end up with some G matrix times the vector of voltages equals the vector of current sources, ok. So, that is what they will have and if by inverting the matrix you can get the solution, ok. Now, you do not have to be alarmed by this inversion, the maximum order we will solve is probably 2 or something by hand and sometimes what I do is uh, we you can set up equations for higher order, but then you can solve it using a symbolic solver or maybe using a numerical solver, ok. But even for that, in fact particularly for that you should be able to set up the equations systematically, ok. And this is my preferred way of inverting the matrix to get the solution, Kramer's rule. Again, this is not uh, that you should use this, but if you are using some haphazard way, you may as well migrate to something like this, okay. To find the node voltage k, you replace the kth column with the right hand side vector and find the determinant divided by the characteristic of the characteristic determinant of the circuit, okay. And this is used for uh, all circuits, whether so far I have showed only conductances, but 
they can be frequency dependent in which case each each of these entries will be a function of the Laplace frequency variable s ok and then you do exactly the same thing that is all and the roots of the determinant of y are the poles of the system ok. So, please go through these slides and if at some point you find that you are not fluent with it go to the basic textbooks and uh, refresh your basics and this is about the Laplace transform. So, if you have a linear time invariant system it can be described using its transfer function h. What does that mean? If the input has a Laplace transform x the output will have a Laplace transform h times x ok that is what it is and if the input is e to the st that is some complex exponential the output is the gain at that exponential frequency h of s times e to the st ok. And for sinusoids s is j omega right the on the complex plane the imaginary axis represents the sinusoids. So, if you have e to the j omega t that is some sinusoid the output will be h at e to the at j omega times e to the j omega t which means that if you have a sinusoid cos omega t it will be modified by its amplitude will be modified by the absolute value of h and the angle will be modified by the angle of h at that particular frequency ok. So, that represents the steady state solution to the circuit ok. Again this thing we will be using as a matter of routine when we come to the circuits right we will be analyzing frequency response and so on that is the reason I am just showing this. Now, Again you can express it in many ways, but uh, the transfer function for all the circuits that we will analyze will be rational polynomial in S. The way I like to factor it is take the DC gain out and then there will be some numerator and some denominator polynomial ok, which can also be expressed as product of uh, terms containing zeros and terms containing the poles. Now it can have a pole at the origin in which case you cannot take the DC gain out the DC gain is infinity if the pole is at the origin then you take something like this out omega u by s and if you have higher order poles at the origin you can take corresponding s square and so on ok. And all the poles uh, p k must be in the left half plane for stability. So, when we come to negative feedback amplifiers we will see the we will see the relevance of this condition ok. So, we can use analysis we can do the analysis in frequency or the time domain. Now, frequency domain analysis is used very often because you end up with algebraic equations instead of differential equations. So, it is easier to set up and solve also. Now, the disadvantage is it works only for linear systems whereas, time domain the differential equations you set up and then by now I am sure you would have forgotten how to solve differential equations or uh, at least I have, but the advantage is that it can be used for nonlinear systems. Now, again we are not looking at solving nonlinear differential equations in uh, in general ok. We will get nonlinearity because of uh, piecewise linearity meaning it will behave as a linear amplifier in some region and saturate in some other region and so on. So, in those cases you will have to set up the equations in time domain and solve them ok. So, it is good uh, it is a good idea to refresh your basics of uh, solving differential equations as well. Bode plots are another thing that you should be familiar with. So, what we mean by Bode plot is it is the sinusoidal steady state response which is characterized by the magnitude of h and the angle of h ok. Now, what is done in a Bode plot is to approximate the regions using straight lines that are either constant or slopes of uh, plus minus 20 times n dB per decade ok. So, it is approximated by straight line segments and it is a good approximation only when you have real poles and zeros, but this is the case that we find most frequently when in uh, this course. So, again this is something that you should be familiar with ok. Body plots are another, another thing that we will use as a matter of routine when we are analyzing the circuits. And how many of you are not familiar with simulators? Everyone has used the spice like you have not used any simulator? ok, but you are familiar with some spice ok. So, for all the assignments for most of the assignments you will have to use the simulator. So, you should get familiar with it and it is also it is like a very powerful calculator right. So, if you have any 
doubts about how some circuit behaves or some device model behaves, you can put it in the simulator and uh, see how it behaves. So, in fact, uh, simulator enables you some experiments that you can't do in the lab. Like, for instance, it's hard to measure very small currents, etc. But you can, in a simulator, measure all kinds of things. Of course, the disadvantage is the simulator only gives you answers to circuits that you have set up and the models that you have chosen. Okay. So, it could be that the models uh, are garbage or maybe you have set up the wrong circuit. You are asking the wrong question, you will get the wrong answer. As long as you are cognizant of it and uh, be careful about it, simulators are very powerful and we use them all the time uh, to do design and even just to understand some things and I think you can also do it. So, you can use MATLAB to do system level analysis like frequency responses, post 0 and so on. MATLAB is very powerful or you can use Octave or some other tool which is equivalent. And you can use SPICE for circuit analysis. We have some SPICE setup, I will send instructions shortly how to use it. There are also some free tools that are available which are SPICE like simulators which can be used for small circuits. Okay. And Maxima is another free tool that I use, frequently use for symbolic analysis. So, when we do analysis in class, sometimes we neglect some terms and so on. So, I also said that uh, it is a kind of a pain to calculate. Uh, if you have three variables, already it is a little bit of a pain to calculate using hand calculations what the solution is. So, in some cases, I use symbolic analysis to do that. Okay. Maxima is a nice tool that you can use. It is probably not very useful for this course, but it is useful in general if you want to see how the solution behaves and so on. In any other case, you can use this one. And these are some references. The first is the textbook. <coughs> the next one is a reference for standard reference for circuit analysis. This is for linear systems and signals. This is for op-amp circuits. And last three are just the sources from which I took those chip photographs. Okay. Any questions on anything I talked about? So, from the next class onwards, we will start the proper course that is to review negative feedback amplifiers and so on. Okay. And please go to the website and see the assignment. This assignment, what I have done is, uh, some of these things I used to calculate in the class. So, this time I thought uh, on the very first day I will give an assignment that will give you a little bit of practice for network analysis. But uh, that is not all that is there in it. Okay. Every one of those circuits will be used in a, is some form of equivalent of a real circuit that we will see later. So, please do pay attention to the way the answers come out and so on. So, that will save time later. We will of course, every week or uh, after every assignment submission we discuss the solutions in class. But uh, this assignment in particular, all of those things are some things that we use in real life. Okay. They are equivalent circuits of some amplifiers or some blocks that we, that are interesting and useful. Okay.